for our scripture reading this morning. You can turn with me in the Word of God to the book of Acts, chapter number 1. And we will simply be reading verses 9 through 12. Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 12. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath's day journey. Let us pray. Father, we come before you this morning in the name of Jesus Christ. And we thank you for allowing us to praise your name. And we thank you once again for giving to us your word. God breathed the 66 books here of the Bible. And we thank you for the great privilege that it is to have the word in our own language. We thank you that down through the ages you have preserved it and have allowed it to be translated. And we thank you that you worked in men and women who, by your grace, were tortured, persecuted, martyred in order that we might have this word. So what a great privilege we recognize, Father, that it is to have the word. And our great responsibility now to listen, to study it, and to take heed concerning what it says so we pray that you would by your spirit open our hearts open our eyes open our ears to the truth of your word and may it sink deep in our ears and through your word have your perfect work to conform the christian into your image to draw the unbeliever unto yourself and as we sang to you be the glory all the glory unto you we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Well, good to have us uh, all gathered together this morning. The beauty of uh, first by verse expository preaching through the Bible is that where you put the word down last week, amen, you can take it up, amen, right here again where... Uh, where we left off last Lord's Day morning. And you remember last Lord's Day morning, we did leave off in verse number eight, where the Lord Jesus Christ, as you remember, has just uh, commissioned his disciples to be his witnesses. And we looked at that word to be his, his martyrs from the city of God in Jerusalem, where this is all going to begin, all the way out to the outermost and uttermost parts of the earth, the Bible says. And, and able to do that, we saw that they were going to be empowered by the giving of the Holy Ghost, amen, to, the, to those men. For that is the only way that men would be able to do what God led them to do, as we see here in the book of Acts, or anything that we would do of any good. It is the power of the Holy Spirit of God living in men, amen, which, of course, is the substance of the Father's promise. And in our text this morning, as we again take up the word of God, we see that the ready scribe, Luke, he, he uses verse 9, 10, 11, and 12, amen, to reveal to you and I the coronation of our king, amen, the king Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. What the disciples were witnessing and what we are witnessing as Brother Dean just prayed this morning through God's inspired, preserved, perfect word, brethren, is in a most amazing thing. We're witnessing this momentous day in which our sovereign king, the Lord Jesus Christ, is completing, if you will, is bringing back around full circle that which he began 
in eternity, amen, as he came and put on flesh for us, amen, to die for his people. We see here in the book of Acts, as Luke opens up again in chapter 1, we see this wonderful completion. You see, it is important, brethren, and most needful for us to understand that his miraculous birth, his sinless life, amen, his atoning death, his resurrection from the grave, and, brethren, this morning, as we are going to look and see, his ascension are most needful and they are most amazing as we see them come from the Father's eternal decrees. These God-ordained prescriptions that, we're going to, that we see together are gloriously chained together. And this is what's important. You can't have one without the other. These things are gloriously chained together in the perfect God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. Without his virgin birth, listen, brethren, there is no sinless life. You, you understand. You see how this, these things are chained together. Amen. Without his sinless life, there's no atoning death. Without his atoning death, there is no resurrection. And brethren, this morning, without his resurrection, there is no ascension. And without his ascension, there is no second coming. So we see here again these how God has chained these things together. These Miraculous events are all chained, as I said, and linked together in the personhood of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the importance of what we're going to be looking at this morning. Again, you can't have one without the other. They all are linked together in his person. Look there, if you would, at Acts chapter 1. Look at verse number 9. Let's read that together as we are started here this morning. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up. And a cloud received him out of their sight. Now, brethren, again, our brother Luke is carefully led by the Holy Spirit of God this morning, uh, through all of eternity in his word, amen, to mention our Lord's ascension four times here in chapter 1. And again, this is important. This We see the importance of the Father as he leads Luke by the Holy Ghost to write these things down. Look at verse 2. Remember, we, we studied verse 2, but look there. He mentions it four times. This, again, is an essential doctrine of the faith. Verse 2, look what it says, until the day which he was taken up. There it is in verse 2. Look at very well, verse 9, our text this morning. Let's just read it together. And when he had spoken these things, while well, they beheld, he was taken up. Look at verse number 11, again, mentioned here. Again, this is the central focus of our text, which also he said, ye men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up at the same Jesus which was taken up from you into heaven? Look at verse 22, again, for the fourth time here in chapter 1 beginning from the baptism of John unto the same day that he was taken up from us. Must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection? Again, brethren, as we have seen, and as we see in Scripture, his ascension is a fundamental doctrine, which the Old, Testament's alluded, the Old Testament prophets alluded to, brethren, in which the Lord Jesus Christ himself spoke of on several occasions. And, of course, as we know, this ascension, which is a fundamental doctrine, of course, was spoken of and written of, of course, in the Gospels themselves. Let me show you. Let's just look at a couple of verses. Look at Psalms 110. Again, the prophets alluded and spoke of this wonderful event. Look at Psalms chapter uh, 110. This is my wife's, one of my wife's favorite verses uh, in Scripture. Psalms 110. Look at verse number one again. The Old Testament prophets writing again of things that they did not quite understand that it was written and led by the Spirit of God to write these things down, and yet there was some cloudiness there, if you will. And yet, look what they write. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstools. Amen. And so you say, well, how is this a reference to his ascension? I'm glad you asked. Look at Mark chapter 16. Again, this idea of his, his enemies being put as uh, uh, down as, uh, as a footstool. Amen. Look at Again, Mark chapter 16, and as you remember, when we preach through Mark chapter 16, Mark chapter 16, 9 through the end of the chapter is supposed to be in the Bible. Amen. All right. It's there. It is supposed to be there. Remember, we looked at that. So look here as we close Mark chapter 16. Look there at verse number 19. Look what the Bible says there. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. So we see here again this, the importance of this ascension. We see the Old Testament prophets 
Jesus being invited in the Old Testament to come and to sit at the right hand of God. When you're sitting at the right hand of God, that is a seat of power and authority and of reigning as a king, brethren. It's an amazing thing. In fact, in the book of Acts, we see our Lord again show up, seated, not this time seated, but standing at the right hand of the Father. Look with me in Acts chapter 7. Again, a very familiar portion of Scripture. The idea here is the importance of his ascension to, again, take his place, his rightful place, seated at the right hand of the Father in all ruling authority. Look at Acts chapter 7. Again, we see him here. Isn't this wonderful? Every other text you see him seated. Here he is not seated. He is rather standing Look at verse number 55. As Stephen is being put to death, the first martyr of the New Testament era, look here at verse 55. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And behold, I see the heavens open, the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And again, this brother, there's, I can't wait to get to this text. We don't have time to go down into it this morning, but... He's standing for a purpose. He's standing there as the first martyr, that which we have just studied last week. You are going to be my witnesses from Jerusalem, the city of God, all the way to the other most. That word witness literally means martyr. And we see here Stephen as he's witnessing for the Lord Jesus Christ, standing right before he is martyred. He is a witness. He is testifying to the truthfulness of that which they are preaching. Luke also records there, for us in Acts chapter 1 verse 9 that a cloud received him out of their sight. I like what one preacher said concerning this. He said at the very instant in which gravity amen is commanded to release our Lord Jesus Christ his pre-incarnate glory reclaims him. Let me say that again the very instant in which gravity is commanded by God to release our Lord and Savior his pre-incarnate glory reclaims him. This is an amazing thing. Look at John. Let me show you what I mean by this. Look at John chapter 17, his high priestly prayer. Again, brethren, in Matthew, Matthew chapter 6 is not the Lord's prayer. Matthew, Matthew chapter 6, that's our prayer. Amen. Here in John chapter 17, we find Christ's prayer. This is his high priestly prayer. John chapter 17. Look what he tells them here. John chapter 17. 17 my pages are all stuck together is it human in here john 17 here it is john chapter 17 look at verse number three there if you would and this is eternal life that they might know thee the only true god and jesus christ whom thou hast sent look at verse four i have glorified thee on the earth i have finished the work which thou gavest me to do and now O father listen to his prayer listen to what he is saying Glorify thee with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Brethren, this is such an amazing thing. The Lord's ascension returns him, amen, to the he his heavenly throne at the right hand of God, declaring to us and to the whole world his eternal sonship. Now, brethren, that has been under attack. This is an amazing doctrine in Scripture, his eternal sonship. What does that mean? That Christ has always existed with the Father and with the Holy Spirit in heaven. He's always been. And believe you me, brethren, when the Bible speaks of the only begotten Son, that does not mean he was created. It means that he is a unique Son. He is a unique Son and that he is sinless. And that, therefore, brethren, amen, as he completes that uh, which the Father sent him, as we see again the priesthood of God the Father sending his son that he might die and shed his blood for his people. And then as he ascends, remember last week we talked about the vicar of Christ. The true vicar of Christ is not the Pope. The true vicar of Christ is the Holy Spirit of God. He takes the place of. And this is why this doctrine is so important and so very much needful. This is not by any stretch of the imagination a tertiary doctrine a secondary doctrine, it is essential to our Christian faith. Look back there now, if you would, at Acts chapter 1. Look there if you would. So the Lord Jesus Christ here, Luke, under the inspiration of God, says that this cloud received him out of their sight. Look at verse number 10. Look at verse number 10 there, if you would. The Bible says, And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, now, brethren, Luke tells us here, doesn't he, 
uh, that when the disciples see the Lord Jesus begin to rise into the air, this is really interesting, they look steadfastly at him. You know, have you ever had or heard had anybody say to you, wow, my eyes are popping out of my head? Have you ever seen, you ever seen something go, wow, my eyes are popping out of my head? That, that term, look steadfastly, literally means that their eyes were on stems. That is, the Lord Jesus is rising up before them, that their eyes are literally bulging out of their heads as they see this most miraculous thing. Again, as, as gravity is removed, as the Lord Jesus begins to rise up, their eyes are standing there looking steadfastly at this thing that's taking place. They're trying to take it in. Can you imagine, brethren, the Lord Jesus, look, they spent three and a half years with him. Think of this for a moment, all that they saw. When we were going through the Gospel of Mark, we saw the Lord Jesus Christ in his perfect godhood, in his perfect manhood, as he was uh, together there, amen, linked together, as he proved over and over again, as he raised the dead, as he calmed the sea, as he, as he healed the lepers, all of these things, God, the Lord Jesus Christ in the flesh, is there reigning, if you will, in his kingdom. It's an amazing thing. Now, it also says what? There was two witnesses there. Doesn't that, the, the Bible says that, right? Because as we all remember, that according to the Jewish law, two was the minimum number in which uh, required for a faithful witness. Two. You remember that. We can quote the Bible. We can go to church discipline in Matthew 18. Remember that a matter must be confirmed by what? By two witnesses or more. Amen. This was the law of Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy, the Bible says the same thing, that two must be there to have a faithful witness. Look at Luke chapter 9. Let's look at this together real quickly this morning. There's witnesses everywhere. Amen. It's, it's an amazing thing to see this. That men trot around in darkness trying to believe the Bible. And the only way they'll believe the Bible is if the Holy Spirit of God opens their eyes to believe the Bible. Amen. But there's witness after witness after witness after witness of these things. Look at Luke chapter 9, if you will. There's a couple of witnesses that show up here. And there's a very specific reason why Moses and Elijah show up. And I want us to read that together this morning. Look at Luke chapter 9. Look at verse number uh, 28. Luke chapter 9. Look at verse number 28. Again, brethren, this is the only time, apart from when they came to the garden to take him in John chapter 18, this is the only time that we see the glory of Christ revealed just a little while he's here on earth. Look here, if you would, what's taking place. Luke chapter 9, look at verse 28. And it came to pass, about an eight days after these sayings, he took Peter, John, and James and went up onto a mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered, and his raiment was white and glistening. And behold, there talked with him how many men? Two men, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory. And spake of his decease. Now, brethren, there's, I wish I had time to delve into this, but let me just say, why Moses and Elijah? Have you ever asked yourself, what, why did Moses and Elijah show up? Why are those the two men that showed up when his glory was being revealed? As the father, again, is the third witness here, as he finally says, this is my son and whom I am well pleased. But Moses and Elijah are there. Let me tell you, I, I wrote this down in my notes. Moses was the, old, uh, the great Old Testament lawgiver and deliverer. And Elijah was the representative of the prophets. Moses' work had been finished by Joshua. Now think about this, brethren. Everything in Scripture, God is so meticulous. He's so perfect. He puts things and brings things to pass according to his perfect will. Uh, finished by Joshua. And Elijah's by Elisha, another form of the name Joshua. So we see this coordinate. There's just a wonderful, beautiful coordination of God here. They now speak with Jesus, whose Hebrew name was Joshua. Think of this, brethren. None of this is by accident. None of it. This is ordained of God perfectly. It's just, I, I don't know, I got chills. I got some things running down my legs. You know what I mean? It's an amazing thing to see the preciseness, the clarity. Uh, his Hebrew name was Joshua. About the exodus he is about to accomplish, listen, by which he would deliver his people from the bondage of sin and bring to fulfillment the work of both Moses and Elijah. Think of that, brethren. 
Joshua speaking with another Joshua whose work was finished by a Joshua. Here he is coming, and he's going to bring all of us, brethren, through his death, through his burial, his resurrection. He's going to bring us all out of bondage. What an amazing thing that is, brethren, to think. But the idea here is that there's two men there. There's two witnesses, always two witnesses. And later on in the book of Revelation, as we all know, amen, if you're a student of your Bible at all, now, there's some difference there. We'll have to wait till I get through Revelation on, on Wednesday evening. Amen. But I do believe the two witnesses in Revelation 11 are Moses and Elijah. I believe they show up again. Amen. Doing the things that they did when they were here the first time. Stopping the rain. Amen. It's an amazing thing to consider. We don't have time there. But there is two witnesses there. Look at Luke chapter 24 again. There's two witnesses. So needful. So important. In fact, you know, our... Our jury system, our law system, our court system was built upon this very thing. Yes, don't be afraid, brothers, to tell the truth about our Christian heritage, okay? Because it is, and it was, it's being destroyed, but it is, and it was. That's why God has you and I, listen, brethren, right here at this very time, this very moment, this very season, to be witnesses be preachers of the gospel to bring light to a dark place i like what john macarthur said this is beautiful what's happening it's beautiful because it's bringing clarity it's bringing division where it should it's bringing clarity to the true believers who will stand with their feet shod with the readiness of the gospel and will preach with great power we will be witnesses martyrs for christ brethren we will look at luke Chapter 24, he has two witnesses at his transfiguration. He has two witnesses at his uh, declaring his resurrection from the dead. This is important. Look at verse 1. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, Two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? Listen, one of the greatest truths in all of holy writ. Look at the next uh, words there. Why are you seeking the living among the dead, brother? Listen, he is not what? Here. He is not here. He has risen from the dead just as he said there was two men standing there in glistening clothes to be witnesses of this wonderful truth that the Lord Jesus Christ is in fact indeed risen from the dead. He is not here. Look at John chapter 20 again just to help us to fill it in. Now these two men who appeared here as we know, what do we always say brethren? If you read a passage of scripture and it's not that clear, you go to another passage of scripture or several other ones that will help you, amen, to, to know what it is. You don't guess. You don't say, well, I think so. Well, uh, from inference, we can get this. No, you go to scriptures that have clarity and they will tell you exactly what the scripture is saying. Look here as John defines these two men who are dressed in white. Apparel, John chapter 20, look at verse number 11. Again, these are resurrection witnesses. These are men who were there. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping. And as she wept, she, stopped, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher and seeth two what? Two angels. There you go. The Bible defines who these two men are. They are men who were by God's great power and authority. They were giving, given the right to come and to manifest themselves as men. Think of that, brethren, for a moment, which is really quite amazing. He says, And seeth two angels in white sitting, one on the, at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say, Under a woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I am not, not where they have laid him. And when she was thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew uh, not that it was Christ. And Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou hast borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus saith unto her, Mary. He's 
spoke her name. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabbi, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. The Lord Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead by the two witnesses, the two angels there saying, why are you here? He's not here. He's right here. In fact, the miraculous work of God. Again, brethren, we see the importance in which God the Father has placed upon this most spectacular event in human history at the mouth of two or more witnesses. This is a biblical teaching. This is a biblical truth. Go to our courts. Well, well you can uh, if you're there. Pray they stay, it stays that way, brethren. Look back there at Acts chapter 1 again. So again, we see this, these resurrection witnesses. We see these, these men throughout Scripture testifying and witnessing and martyring for the truthfulness of Christ. Look here at verse number 11, Acts chapter 1. Look at verse number 11. Which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye here gazing up into heaven again? Here it is, bringing back the idea that the Lord Jesus is ascending. The same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven, listen, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Brethren, we couldn't be more grateful this morning that Luke describes for you and I. You realize, brethren, that in the last days, which we are in the last days, well, since the cross, we've been in the last days. But in the last day, there will be many, many lying wonders and signs. Many, brethren. And I promise you this morning, as we look at our text, that God has revealed to us to know from Holy Scripture that there's one thing for sure. That what we're going to look at right now, the devil will never be able to mimic or imitate. You realize he can do that. You realize when they were coming out of Egypt that it was mimicked. Three of the things the Lord did was mimicked. And then God stopped it. And he raised himself said, I'm the God of God, the King of Kings. And from that point on, it was over. If you go into the book of Revelation, you see Satan mimicking the holiness of God and his evilness. You know there's an unholy trinity in the book of Revelation. He mimics the holiness of God in such an evil and wicked way. And yet, brethren, Luke assures us this morning, we talked about it in Sunday school, or in Bible study, I mean, excuse me, in Bible study. We talked about it. What does the word of God say? If you want to have feelings, and it's okay to have them, we should have feelings. But you make sure the word of God is producing those feelings. Not the other way around. It cannot be, brother. And you'll be off the reservation. What's that? Old? You'll be so far off the reservation, you don't know which end is up because your feelings cannot be trusted. Amen. They cannot be. So therefore, we must look at Scripture and say, what does God say? Irregardless of what's going on around us, we put those, remember them horses? They, we just put them blinder things on them. You put those blinders on and you look at the word of God and say, yes, God. Yes. He will not be able to mimic this thing. Now, brethren, just as the two resurrection witnesses at the Lord's tomb relayed the glorious message that Christ is not here, he's not at the tomb, but he has in fact risen from the dead. So do, the, so do these two witnesses have a message Listen, we're about to celebrate it right here. The message is this, that this same Jesus, whom you witnessed, whom they witnessed ascending into heavens, will in fact return to the earth in the same way they saw him go into the sky. How did the Lord Jesus ascend into heaven? How did he go? Well, number one, he went physically. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. You know, the, the, his resurrection from the dead was not some swooning and something that he showed up in a spiritual body. No, he physically raised from the dead. And we see here in Scripture that he physically ascended to the heavens. That's your first clue. Second of all, he ascended there visibly. You got eyes. Yeah, like we said, their eyes were on the sticks and stems. They're out here looking, seeing him go up. And they're looking, going, oh, the Lord Jesus is ascending to heaven. So yes, he went physically, he went visibly, and most importantly, brethren, he went in a cloud of glory. 
It is a stunning thing. This same Jesus, they said, will come this exact same way. And brethren, if you think that Satan is going to be able to mimic him coming in the glorious, in his glory and power, you are crazier than you look. I'm pretty crazy looking, so that's pretty bad. It will not happen. Look at Matthew 24. Let's just look again at the word of God. How will he come? Brethren, don't listen to the false prophets. Don't listen to the, well, you know, I hate to pick on people, but sometimes you got just got to, you know, the blood. How many times has someone brought to our attention the blood moons and all this nonsense? How many times? And how many times have they been wrong? How many times? Time after time after time. It's just like the Jehovah Witnesses and all the rest of the cults. You know, Jesus is not coming quietly. Jesus did not come in 1963 in a garage somewhere and nobody saw it. Oh, no. There is a grand time coming for the Christian. When they see their Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, coming with great power and great glory, physically, visibly, and reigning in great power, brother. I don't know about you, but my legs are just, I want to, well, I remember that. My, what was that reporter? Remember that one devilish reporter? Yeah, when he sees Bill Clinton walk in the room, he gets a shiver down his leg. I get a shiver down my spine, down my leg, when we think of our sovereign God who will come and squash all of his enemies. Amen? What an amazing thing that is for us, brethren. Look at Mark 24. Let me show you here. Verse 29. Look what the Bible says. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. We looked at this a while back. Remember that the heavens declare these things. The heavens declared his first coming. Remember? The star. Yeah, the heavens were declaring. Here he is. He's right here. Oh, it's going to happen again. They will declare his second coming. Yes, they will. The moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from the heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Listen. And then shall all the tribes of the earth. Again, Jesus didn't show up in a garage in 1963. You know why those devils lie like that all the time? Because they're constantly making prophecies that don't come true. So then they got to they somehow try and rectify what they're saying. And so all the tribes of the earth mourn. Listen, and they shall see the Son of Man coming where? In the clouds, listen, of heaven with power and great glory. That's exactly how he went up. He, they saw him go up physically, right? They saw him by sight. He went up. I mean, he ascended up into the clouds. How? With great glory. In fact, if you go and look, he was blessing the disciples as he went, amen, in great glory and power. All shall see the Son of Man coming that way. Verse 31, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds of, from one end of heaven to the other. Look what Luke records. Look at Luke 21. Just a couple of them here. I like reading this. I like to hear these words. I want God, the Holy Spirit of God, just to drill it deep down into my soul so that when liars come, I can open my Bible and go, no, right here, the Bible says it. Look here at Luke chapter 21. Look at Luke 21. Here's what the Bible says again. 21, verse 25. Luke 21, look at verse number 25. And there shall be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. Men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Look at the description again, brethren. Look, brothers, there's no missing this. It is clear this same Jesus who went up this way will come exactly the same way. Look at what it says there. Look at verse 27. And then thou shalt see the Son of Man coming in a what? Cloud. And what? Power. And great glory. Brother, listen. And when these things begin to pass, then look up and lift up your heads. For your redemption draweth nigh. Jesus will come back with his resurrected, glorified body. Listen, there will be no mistaking him. There will be no mistaking him. Okay? 
not on your life. You will see, and I will see, the marks of his crucifixion. Let me show you this. Look at Luke chapter 24. Look at here, Luke 24, we're right there. Look at verse 36. Luke 24, look at verse number 36. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled? Why did, and why do thoughts arise in your hearts? What does he say? Behold my what? My hands and my feet. Why would, they, why would he say, look at my hands and my feet? Why would he say that? Because he was just crucified. His hands and his feet were pierced. And he's raised now in his glorified body. He says, these are the marks that you'll know it's me. Look at my hands and my feet. What does he say there? And see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. He goes on there in verse number 40. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have ye any meat? Well, this is right before verse number 49. Look at verse 49. He says, I'll be identified by my hands and my feet. You will see that. I showed them to you right before this happens. We read it last week. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem till ye be endowed with power from on high. And he led them out as far to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and what? And blessed them. Again, Luke's account. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried where? Up into heaven. Now his markings were there when he left. Do we find these markings anywhere else in Scripture? Oh, yes. Yes, he was raised in his glorified body with his crucified body, but it's the same body, the same Jesus. These marks are there. Look at Revelation chapter 5. Again, way back here. <laughs> way back here, brethren. Oh, yes. There will be no mistaking our Lord Jesus Christ when he comes physically and visibly and gloriously in a cloud. There will be no mistaking him. Look at Revelation chapter 5. Look at verse number 5. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne of the four beasts, in the midst of the elders stood a what? A lamb, as if it had been what? Slain. Who's the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world? The Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, he's there in heaven, and they're seeing these. he's being marked out because of who he is, the lamb which was slain. That is his identity, brethren. Having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. Look at verse 7. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty uh, elders 